think uh, there's another on another video presentation. Uh, Jennifer Hinton, Hinton uh, is co-director of the Post Growth Institute, is co-authoring an upcoming book, How on Earth, a book that presents a vision of a socially and ecologically sustainable world economy based on non-profit enterprise and how we can build current trends to get there by 2050. Her expertise in systems thinking is in systems thinking, and she has a contagious enthusiasm for moving beyond humanity's current crisis. She presently resides in Athens, Greece, where she also teaches English. So she seems to have worked out a good life. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Can you hear me there? Yes. Yes. Can you hear us? Okay, great. Um, Oh, I've got a little bit of echo, but that shouldn't be too big of a problem. Um, okay, so I'll get started. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, you know, I'm in Athens, Greece, so it's pretty early morning for me. It's 7 o'clock, um, but I'm happy to be in Australia at the same time. Um, and I, um, I'm going to talk to you today about an economic model that we've been developing for the last couple of years at the Post Growth Institute. Um, and the economic model is not the not-for-profit world uh, economic model, like the introducer just um, mentioned. And um, I'm going to start the talk with um, a bit about how and why I got involved with this project um, and take you a little bit through the journey that I went on in getting involved with this project. Um, then I'll give you some of the details and a bit, bit of a uh, bird's eye view of the model um, and show you how it's post growth, how it, how it aligns with the steady state economy. And I'll con conclude with ways that we can all support um, the emergence of the not-for-profit world. So um, my journey with this model started with a few aha moments. Um, Donnie McLaren, um who is the co-founder, one of the co-founders of the Post Growth Institute, um, had the vision for a not-for-profit world economic model, um, and he wanted help developing it. So he brought it to our core group at the Post Growth Institute. And um, when he when he said, you know, imagine an entire economy based on not-for-profit enterprise, um, something drew me into that idea, even though I wasn't very clear as to what he meant by not-for-profit enterprise. Um, I wasn't clear at all as, as to how an entire economy could be organized in that way, um, but I was curious, and so I said, okay, Donnie, tell me more. Um, and so over the course of quite a few conversations, um, he clarified to me that not-for-profit enterprise is um, it's a business model, it's a set of legal structures all over the world um, that don't have, don't allow for distribution of profits. So. Um, in, in a private capacity, the 100% of the profits must be reinvested back into the business or the business's mission, um, and it is mission-based and it varies from, from country to country, but it always has to be socially or environmentally um, mission-oriented, and it's not charity-dependent, so I'll go more into that in a minute. Um, but So I, he told me this, and I was curious, I wanted to hear more. Um, then he explained to me that his vision of having an entire economy based on not-for-profit enterprise came from the, this sort of revelation he had that, wait, this reinvesting mechanism of not-for-profit enterprise actually on, on an economic scale, on an entire market scale, would translate into um, a redistributionary mechanism of wealth. Okay, so I was even more intrigued. I said, okay, that's wonderful. Tell me more. And he mentioned um, that not-for-profit enterprises um, can't be owned by individuals. Um, so ownership becomes more like stewardship in the not-for-profit world. And I was thrilled, <laughs> uh, because we all know how, how destructive private ownership can be. Um, so um, then he told me one of the most exciting things is that, look, the entire idea for this model came from the fact that this is an emerging trend. It's happening all over the world. Not-for-profit enterprises are just popping up like crazy. 
Um, there was a recent Johns Hopkins report that uh, reported that 53% of not-for-profits income is um, now self-generated. And this is in 26 different countries, including the US and Canada, the UK and Australia. Um, and I said, okay, let's write this book. <laughs> Um, okay, so perhaps the biggest aha moment for me was coming to the realization that we live in a for-profit world, um, because it's never framed that way. We just take it for granted that um, business is for-profit by nature, and so the economy is somehow for-profit, but we, we very rarely think in these terms. Um, so that was a very big aha moment for me, and so what do we mean by uh, we live in a for-profit world. And so it's just the fact that most economic transactions occur in a for-profit way today. Um, and that's, what does that mean? It means that owners and investors go into business expecting a portion of a company's profit in the form of dividends, options, or shares, or even assets. Um, and this is actually, if we look at it, has been very destructive. Um, Richard was just talking about inequality and how, how destructive that can be in terms of power relations. Um, the spirit level went into lots of detail about how destructive inequality can be and how it's on the rise. And Oxfam's report earlier this year told us that 85, the 85 richest people in the world own the same amount of wealth as the 3.5 poorest, uh, 3.5 billion poorest people in the world. So this is, this is crazy. Um, Thomas Piketty's book just came out recently saying that, that this inequality is somehow inherent in capitalism. And Thomas Hungerford um, published an article in 2003, or sorry, 2013, um, in which he came to the conclusion that by far the greatest contributor to this increase in income inequality, at least in the US, was in the form of capital gains and dividends. So that um, ties the inequality phenomenon that we're seeing directly to for-profit business. Um, and then not to mention the, the fact that for-profit companies are under pressure to maximize uh, profits, like uh, Richard also mentioned, and shareholder value. And so they're actually pressured to cut social and ecological mm -hmm. corners and um, ignore social and ecological consequences of their business activities. Um, but perhaps what, what clicked more deeply with me about this model than anything else um, was something I've been looking at as a systems thinker for a while and you know, um, being exposed and, and really um, attracted to Danella Meadows' leverage points of how we can change the system, change paradigms. Um, so what really clicked with me was this idea of the underlying stories of our economic system and of our business models. Um, and the for-profit world is clearly based on a for-profit ethic that has roots in a um, story of human nature that's just a couple hundred years old. And the story goes that um, human nature, our species, is mostly greedy, mostly competitive. We're cold and calculating animals, right? Um, and so based on this story of human nature, Obviously, the best way to motivate economic interaction is with the profit motive, the privatization of profit. Um, what's in it for me, right? And this for-profit ethic is a me-first ethic, and it's an ethic of never enough, of, of constant accumulation. Um, so, and, and the field of, um, oh, sorry. So the not-for-profit ethic is based on a totally different story. Um, it's based on a story, not that, that we're all generous and angels, but that human nature is complex, that we are uh, capable of being greedy and competitive, but we're also capable of being generous and cooperative, um, and we're not as cold and calculating, and certainly not as rational as our for-profit business model and for-profit for economic model assume. Um, so the not-for-profit ethic, and you know, this is all being delved into more deeply all the time in the fields of behavioral economics and social psychology. Um, Dan Pink has written that book about his book about motivation, and he's done several nice talks about purpose-based motivation versus the profit motive. 
Um, so we're coming to, to terms with a different story of human nature that acknowledges the complexity of our species and human motivation, excuse me. Um, so the not-for-profit ethic is an ethic of enough. Um, and I think that speaks very well to, to a steady state economy group. It's an ethic that acknowledges our interconnectedness and our interdependence. Um, and I'm happy to report that not-for-profit enterprises all over the world are embodying this new, this different story, this not-for-profit ethic, um, every day in the business world. Um, so again, I just want to clarify once more because, you know, I wasn't familiar with this, and I assume a lot of other people aren't so familiar with this. What a not-for-profit enterprise actually is. Um, so it's different from for-profit enterprise in that it can't, uh, doesn't allow for the privatization of profit, so no profit can be extracted from the business in a private capacity. 100% um, again must be reinvested into the company itself or the company's mission, um, and it's always got a social and or ecological mission. Um, so it's mission-based as well. Now it's also important for us in our model to differentiate this from traditional nonprofit organizations <clears throat> that are um, most often charity dependent because this sort of new breed of uh, not-for-profit enterprise and it's not it's not super new I mean it goes back decades um, but this these not-for-profit enterprises seek to be financially self-sufficient they have business models they see themselves as businesses but they don't want to privatize their profit. They, they see it as an advantage to reinvest the profit because they are socially or um, ecologically oriented. So they're not dependent on philanthropy and grants. I mean, to some extent, many of them are, but our cutoff line is um, at least half of, of their revenue must be self-generated through the sales of good, goods and services. Um, so really what not-for-profit enterprise, what we're talking about here is not for private profit. A lot of these companies make a lot of profit. I mean, that is the surplus after um, operational expenses have been covered. And um, they make good profits, but they just don't, they reinvest them into their mission rather than privatize them. Um, of course, this isn't just black and white. I mean, saying the terms for profit and not for profit makes it seem like it's sort of just black and white, one or the other. Um, but there is a spectrum that we're looking at. And there are lots of interesting things happening in the spectrum that are moving the economy um, in a more not-for-profit direction. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen with you real quick. Trying not to do this too clumsily. Um, can you see my screen now? Oh, I can't hear you guys at all, but that's okay. Um, that's because of the feedback, I'm sure. So here is um, the, the spectrum uh, from for-profit over here to not-for-profit. Um, as you can see, we uh, the vertical axis goes from uh, profit not being a priority at all at the bottom <laughs> to profit being a top priority at the top. And the, the axis here runs from who gains from the profit, from the community, and in the middle there's members, and on the far end, there's owners, investors, shareholders, etc. Um, so, of course, the most for-profit on this this image is the listed corporation, so a company um, traded on the stock exchange. Um, but then here, here's the area. These green dots, are, or sorry, these orange dots, are the ones that that I was just speaking of that are moving us in the not-for-profit direction. So there are benefit corporations in the U.S. Um, those must be by law for profit, but they are moving in the not-for-profit direction by trying to stay uh, close to a social mission. Then there are for-profit social enterprises in Europe where I live. These are um, becoming a lot more common. They're still for profit, but they are trying to be even more embedded in their social or environmental mission. Um, and then, of course, worker-owned co-ops are all over the world. And those benefit the members, um, so it's it's less privatized. I mean, the profit is less privatized. Um, okay, so we're trying to our our vision of the economy is to have everything within this yellow box, this zone of not-for-profit enterprise, where the community is who gains from the profit. 
Um, so there's a lot of diversity within that yellow box. Just wanted to point this out briefly. Um, there's all kinds of, of co-ops. There are not-for-profit purchasing co-ops, not-for-profit um, consumer co-ops. Um, there is a not-for-profit version of the community interest company in the UK. Um, there are not-for-profit social enterprises in Europe and the US. And um, all of the credit unions, interestingly, in the US um, must be not-for-profit by law. So all of the credit unions in the US, which have now 100 million members, are not-for-profit banks. Um, great, so I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, yeah, I hope that's not sharing anymore. Okay. Um, so, why are we drawing the line, you might ask? Why, why have that yellow box? Why distinguish not-for-profit from for-profit? Why do we see that as such a valuable and important thing to do that we've actually really stuck to our guns in calling the, the uh, model not-for-profit world rather than for-benefit or for-purpose? Um, and basically, it's because there is a legal structure that's almost universal worldwide um, that doesn't allow for the privatization of profit, like I mentioned. And we really believe that anything more than a good living wage and purposeful work um, gets into the, the area of speculation and greed that has been so destructive in our economy. Um, so some examples of how the not-for-profit world is emerging. Um, you know, there are thousands of not-for-profit enterprises all over the world, and we are creating a database. Um, some of the bigger names that you might know are Mozilla, that designed the Firefox browser, um, the YMCA, which is worldwide, uh, Bupa Insurance is a not-for-profit, um, <laughs> TED that does the TED Talks, they're a not-for-profit enterprise, the Mayo Clinic, world-renowned hospital, is a not-for-profit enterprise, and um, IKEA Furniture Company, actually, Swedish furniture company, is a not-for-profit enterprise. Um, and we've found not-for-profit enterprises so far, and we're, we're building the databases as, as fast as we can in all sectors of the economy, um, aside from sectors that are specifically stock exchange based. But we've, we've got examples in energy, manufacturing, hospitality, banking, insurance, telecommunications, entertainment, food and beverage, and then, uh, of course, like the more traditional uh, places where not-for-profits have been, healthcare and education. But there are even um, new not-for-profit enterprises that are developing drugs, which is um, nice to see not-for-profits doing that. You know, totally changes when you have the not-for-profit ethic involved in pharmaceuticals, rather than the for-profit, profit-maximizing <laughs> ethic. Um, let me just check the time here. I've got a little stopwatch to keep me. OK, so I've got a few minutes. Um, now, so basically, I wanted to show that the foundation, because it is happening all over the world in all of these different sectors, foundation for a not-for-profit world economy is already being laid. Um, this is part of a larger cultural shift toward the not-for-profit ethic. Um, we see things like collaborative consumption and peer-to-peer -peer production, the open source movement, localization, things like transition towns. So this is just part of this whole emergence of a not-for-profit ethic of, of moving, tending towards that. Um, the, and, and we are seeing, um, based on our research, that the not-for-profit trend will continue because not-for-profits are gaining more and more competitive advantages over their for-profit counterparts. Um, and this is due to this purpose-based motivation that's sort of bubbling up, um, higher and the growing demand for ethical products and services. I read an article just the other day about the millennial generation with, um, presenting a much higher demand for ethical products and services. Um, decreasing profit margins in the for-profit space um, due to resource, scarce, uh, resource scarcity, um, along with some other factors. And then new ways of financing via crowdfunding and community bonds, which are closer to the not-for-profit ethic. Um, and the cooperative nature of not-for-profits, that they do help each other, so it, it allows them to be more competitive in the current market. 
Okay, um, so the not-for-profit world is based on current trends, um, has not-for-profit enterprise as its centerpiece, um, but it's also looking at an entire market, an entire economy organized in not-for-profit ways, which like I just mentioned, it, it's more cooperative. Um, it has not-for-profit ownership at the center, which is more like stewardship that I mentioned before, which is, you know, get away from all of this destructive speculation that's going on. Um, and it's based on, not for pro on the not-for-profit ethic and not-for-profit values, which is an ethic of enough. Um, and this really is an economics of enough because, as I mentioned towards the beginning of the presentation, the reinvesting nature of not-for-profit enterprise does translate to redistribution in an economic, uh, in a home market sense, um, in that the, the money that any surplus is always reinvested back into um, meeting human needs and rather than being extracted because really privatizing profit is is extractive and it, it's actually really an inefficient way to run a business isn't it when you could act if you want to um, further your business this is resistance basically you reinvest your profit um and what more again do we need than good wages and purposeful work um, so I just want to point out really quick because I might be running out of time. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up here. But, um, you know, reform and regulation, and I'm sure that a lot has been said about that at the conference so far, will always be important. Um, but what we're saying here is that um, this is, we want to set a new minimum standard and new expectations for, the business, for business and for the economy. It, this is not um, a utopia, this isn't going to be sufficient to change everything, but it is necessary. Uh, and we need new measures of economic success, we need environmental taxes, we can push for banking regulations in a shorter working week and build community currencies, but we can't have a steady state economy without moving beyond for-profit business. Um, so it's a business model of enough, an, e an ethic of enough, and an economics of enough. So that's where I'll end for now. Um, thank you very much here. I'll share the screen just one more time to show you um, the information for my, my contact information and information about the book we're writing. Oops. Oops. I'm sorry, I'm being a bit clumsy with this. Uh, yeah, so there's my contact information. Um, if you want more, more information or you want to discuss this, there's my email address, jen at postgrowth.org. Um, the name of the book is How on Earth, Flourishing in a Not-for-Profit World by 2050. Um, you can look it up on our website, postgrowth.org. And yeah, thank you so much for, for having me today. And thanks to Hayden for inviting me. <laughs>